Hello and welcome to Great Works. I'm your host, Professor Peter Plumbaugh. Today we examine the question, why study great literature? I think there are probably many ways to answer that question. My approach is to focus on two themes that recur over and over again in great literature, the problem of evil and the meaning of suffering. They relate to today's world just as they always have. All you have to do is look at the news. The news in the last couple of years has been disturbing. Mass shootings, hate crimes, racial injustice, social turmoil, climate change, hurricanes, war in Ukraine, and a frightful pandemic. But as bad as things may be, this is not the human race's first rodeo. Let's see how great writers have grappled with the problem of evil and suffering over the centuries. Here are the works that I would like to submit for your consideration. You have just finished studying Hamlet, and so this video will focus on the other five writings. Notice here on this timeline that the lives of the authors span four centuries. Take a moment to consider how much the world has changed in that time. Yet the themes remain timeless. Before we delve into these works, let us consider for a moment how, over the millennia, every religion has tried to explain evil and suffering in its own way. The gods of Greek mythology were continually quarreling with each other, and they often dragged humans into their petty rivalries. According to the book of Genesis in the Hebrew Bible, Adam and Eve and their descendants could have lived happily ever after in the Garden of Eden if they had not disobeyed God by biting into an apple from the tree of knowledge. Throughout the Hebrew Bible, one finds the same theme over and over. Disobedience to God and his laws leads to suffering among Jews, often at the hands of Israel's enemies. Original sin, a concept developed by early Christian theologians, refers to the belief that because the first humans disobeyed God by eating the apple, all of their descendants share in their guilt and are born with a tendency toward sinful behavior. Then along comes Leibniz. He admitted that God created a world with evil in it and that because God is all powerful, he could have created a world without evil if he had wanted to. Nevertheless, he maintains that the world created by God is the best of all possible worlds because God would not create anything less than the best. His conclusion is that some amount of evil is necessary in the best of all possible worlds. As he put it, it may happen that an evil is accompanied by a greater good and that an imperfection in the part may be required for perfection in the whole. Notice that Leibniz's explanation of why evil exists is quite a departure from standard Christian doctrine. Many philosophers were not convinced by Leibniz's logic. Among them was Voltaire, who was thereby compelled to write Candide in protest of Leibniz's philosophy. Candide is a young man who has grown up in the castle of a German baron alongside the Princess Cunegonde. He is said to be honest, trusting, pure of heart, and unable to tell a lie. Both he and the princess are tutored by Professor Pangloss, a disciple of Leibniz, who teaches them that they live in the best of all possible worlds. Pangloss was professor of metaphysico theologico cosmolonigology He proved admirably that there is no effect without a cause, and that in this best of all possible worlds, the Baron's castle was the most magnificent of castles, and his lady the best of all possible baronesses. It is demonstrable, said he, that things cannot be otherwise than as they are, for all being created for an end, all is necessarily for the best end. 
Observe that the nose has been formed to bear spectacles. Thus, we have spectacles. Legs are visibly designed for stockings, and we have stockings. Stones were made to be hewn and to construct castles. Therefore, my lord has a magnificent castle. For the greatest baron in the province ought to be the best lodged. Pigs were made to be eaten. Therefore, we eat pork all the year round. Consequently, they who assert that all is well have said a foolish thing. They should have said, all is for the best. Anyway, just as a forbidden romance is starting to develop between Candide and Cunegonde, war breaks out between Germany and France, and the three main characters find themselves refugees fleeing for their lives to escape the atrocities of war. But their adventures are just beginning, as they find themselves in one dangerous predicament after another. The book is a travelogue of human misery, suffering, evil, and tragedy. Everywhere they go, they witness mass killings, rape, torture, natural disasters, and plague. But here is the twist. The book is meant to be humorous, and it is. It is a satire, and Voltaire is suggesting that evil and suffering are everywhere, but he is poking fun at the idea that suffering and evil are part of some grand design. Instead, he implies that suffering is due to people's own foolishness, superstition, greed, hatred, pride, and jealousies, or, in other cases, just bad luck. Like all successful satires, it is based partly on true events, but the story itself is so fantastical, implausible, and ironic that you find yourself amused instead of saddened. Through satire, Voltaire is able to create some emotional distance from all the suffering in order to ease the pain, if only momentarily. Here is one example. At one point, Candide and Pangloss arrive in Portugal, after almost drowning at sea, at the time of the famous Lisbon earthquake, which occurred on All Saints Day in 1755. Combined with the effects of the resulting tsunami and fire, the earthquake killed as many as 60,000 people, many of whom were attending Mass at the time. What happened next made the tragedy even worse. As one historian put it, the local religious authorities exploited the situation and the superstitiousness of the people, declaring that the earthquake was a punishment by God for the sins of the world. According to Voltaire, After the earthquake had destroyed three-fourths of Lisbon, the sages of that country could think of no means more effectual to prevent utter ruin than to give the people a beautiful auto de fe. For it had been decided by the University of Coimbra that the burning of a few people alive by a slow fire and with great ceremony is an infallible secret to hinder the earth from quaking. Accordingly, heretics were rounded up, including an innocent man from Biscay, and two men who were noted to have left bacon uneaten upon their plate. When spies overhear Pangloss yet again explaining his philosophy to Candide, they find his views inconsistent with Catholic teachings and report him to the Grand Inquisitor, who agrees they must be heretics. Candide and Pangloss are made to dress up in ridiculous costumes. They marched in procession, thus habited, and heard a very pathetic sermon, followed by fine church music. Candide was whipped in cadence while they were singing. The Biscayan and the two men who had refused to eat bacon were burnt, and Pangloss was hanged, though that was not the custom. The same day, there was another earthquake which made most dreadful havoc. Candide, terrified, amazed, desperate, all bloody, all palpitating, said to himself, If this is the best of possible worlds, what then are the others? 
As it turns out, Pangloss survived the hanging, and in the end, after many other misadventures, all three main characters and a few other secondary characters, including another traveling philosopher named Martin, are reunited in Turkey, where they live on a small communal farm. They are finally safe, but there is just one problem. They are bored. What is to be done, they wondered. In the neighborhood, there lived a very famous dervish who was esteemed the best philosopher in all Turkey, and they went to consult him. Pangloss was the speaker. Hey, master, said he, we come to beg you to tell why so strange an animal as man was made. With what meddlest thou, said the dervish, is it thy business? But, reverend father, said Candide, there is horrible evil in this world. What signifies it? said the dervish, whether there be evil or good. When his highness sends a ship to Egypt, does he trouble his head whether the mice on board are at their ease or not? What then must we do? said Pangloss. Hold your tongue, answered the dervish. I was in hopes, said Pangloss, that I should reason with you a little about causes and effects, uh, about the best of possible worlds, um, the origin of evil, the nature of the soul, and uh, the pre-established harmony. At these words, the dervish shut the door in their faces. During this conversation, the news was spread that two viziers and the mufti had been strangled at Constantinople and that several of their friends had been impaled. This catastrophe made a great noise for some hours. Pangloss, Candide and Martin, returning to the little farm, saw a good old man taking the fresh air at his door under an orange bower. Pangloss, who was as inquisitive as he was argumentative, asked the old man what was the name of the strangled Mufti. I do not know, answered the worthy man, and I have not known the name of any Mufti nor of any vizier. I am entirely ignorant of the event you mention. I presume, in general, that they who meddle with the administration of public affairs die sometimes miserably, and that they deserve it. But I never trouble my head about what is transacting at Constantinople. I content myself with sending there for sale the fruits of the garden which I cultivate. Having said these words, he invited the strangers into his house. His two sons and two daughters presented them with several sorts of sherbet, which they made themselves, with kaimak enriched with the candied peel of citrons, with oranges, lemons, pineapples, pistachio nuts, and mocha coffee unadulterated with the bad coffee of Batavia or the American islands. After which, the two daughters of the honest Mussulman perfumed the stranger's beards. You must have a vast and magnificent estate, said Candide to the Turk. I have only twenty acres, replied the old man. I and my children cultivate them. Our labor preserves us from three great evils. And what, according to the old man, are the three great evils that humans can escape through hard work? Boredom, vice, and need. Candide and his companions are inspired to go home and throw themselves into the task of developing a prosperous farm. Let us work, said Martin, without disputing. It is the only way to render life tolerable. The whole little society entered into this laudable design according to their different abilities. Their little plot of land produced plentiful crops. Cunigonde was indeed very ugly, but she became an excellent pastry cook. Paquette worked at embroidery. The old woman looked after the linen. They were all, not excepting Friar Giroflé, of some service or other, for he made a good joiner and became a very honest man. Pangloss sometimes said to Candide, 
There is a concatenation of events in this best of all possible worlds, for if you had not been kicked out of a magnificent castle for love of Miss Cunegonde, if you had not been put into the Inquisition, if you had not walked over America, if you had not stabbed the Baron, if you had not lost all your sheep from the fine country of El Dorado, you would not be here eating preserved citrons and pistachio nuts. All that is very well, answered Candide, but let us cultivate our garden. Let's travel now from Turkey to Russia. Set in the 19th century, The Brothers Karamazov is widely regarded as one of the greatest novels of all time. The main characters are the three Karamazov brothers, Alyosha, the monk, who has a strong faith in God and is a sensitive and caring soul, Ivan, the intellectual, who is tormented by the problem of evil and all the senseless suffering in the world, and finally Dmitri, who is the impulsive, emotional one. He has money problems, women problems, and he sometimes drinks far too much. The story centers around the murder of the three brothers' father, and thus entails a mystery surrounding the identity of the killer, the subsequent courtroom drama, and throughout it all, an extended exposition of how each brother grapples with human suffering in his own way. In this presentation, I will focus on a profoundly moving episode that makes up the chapter entitled The Grand Inquisitor. Ivan, the atheist, and Alyosha, the devout monk, have a close relationship built on mutual respect, for each recognizes that the other's very different worldview nevertheless represents a sincere response to human suffering, to which both are profoundly sensitive. At one point, Ivan shares with Alyosha a story he has made up. He calls it a poem, which is set in Spain at the time of the Spanish Inquisition. In the poem, Jesus is not too happy about this whole idea of burning people at the stake. And so he comes down to earth, to a town in Spain, Seville, where the burning of heretics is taking place. In his boundless mercy, he passes once more among men in that same human form in which for three years he walked among men 15 centuries earlier. He comes down to the hot streets and squares of the southern town in which only the previous day, in a resplendent auto de fe, in the presence of the king, the court, the knights, the cardinals, and the loveliest ladies of the court, in the presence of the numerous population of all Seville, there had been burned by the cardinal grand inquisitor very nearly a good hundred heretics, all in one go. Ad maiorem gloriam dei. He has appeared quietly, unostentatiously, and yet, strange this, everyone recognises him. That could have been one of the best bits in my poem. I mean, the question of why it is that everyone recognises him. The people rush towards him with invincible force, surround him, mass around him, follow him. Saying nothing, he passes among them with a quiet smile of infinite compassion. The Grand Inquisitor promptly recognizes that Jesus is a rival for the people's respect and a threat to his own authority. He has Jesus arrested and imprisoned. He sentences Jesus to be burned at the stake on the following morning. That night, the Grand Inquisitor visits Jesus in his cell and undertakes a lengthy monologue in defense of the Inquisition and tries to explain why he has condemned Jesus. The Inquisitor's basic argument is this. Jesus made people miserable by expecting too much of them. You desired that man's love should be free, that he should follow you freely, enticed and captivated by you. Henceforth, in place of the old firm law, man was himself to decide with a free heart what is good and what is evil, with only your image before him to guide him. But surely you never dreamed that he would at last reject and call into question even your image and your truth, were he to be oppressed by so terrible a burden as freedom of choice. 
They will exclaim at last that the truth is not in you, for it would have been impossible to leave them in more confusion and torment than you did when you left them so many worries and unsolvable problems. Thus, you yourself laid the foundation for the destruction of your own kingdom, and no one else should be blamed for it. Remember Hamlet's dilemma? How should someone respond to the evil acts of others? Do the Gospels always provide a clear answer? I think it can be hard to interpret some of Jesus' teachings and apply them to real life. Take, for example, Jesus' second great commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. It sounds simple enough, but it's not. For example, who exactly is my neighbor? Can a Jew qualify as my neighbor? Can a Muslim? Do I have to love my neighbor always, even when they do me wrong? What if my neighbor steals from me or kills my father? And what exactly is my reward in this world for loving my neighbor? In short, according to the Grand Inquisitor, a single set of explicit and rigid religious beliefs and rules is necessary to create a peaceful, harmonious society in which humans can enjoy sustained happiness. In order to convince everyone to follow the same set of beliefs, the Grand Inquisitor believes it is sometimes necessary to burn heretics at the stake. The Grand Inquisitor is essentially arguing that it is necessary to take away people's freedom, specifically their freedom of thought, in order to allow them lasting happiness during their lifetime. And the Grand Inquisitor is willing to take on the responsibility for committing this grand deception on behalf of the common people. But here's the best part. Jesus has been silent the entire time. And when the Grand Inquisitor finally finishes his defense, he is just a bit afraid of how Jesus might respond. However, Jesus says nothing but simply kisses the old man gently on the lips. The Grand Inquisitor is startled. Then, after a moment, he opens the cell door, letting Jesus escape, while telling him to go and never come back. During Ivan's recounting of his poem, Alyosha becomes increasingly agitated. Finally, he interrupts Ivan and protests that the poem is not a fair portrayal of either Jesus or of the Catholic Church. In truth, Ivan's poem is clearly meant as a criticism of organized religion. But then Jesus' kiss at the end is ambiguous. Is Jesus forgiving the Grand Inquisitor? Realizing that Alyosha is upset, Ivan asks if his brother is offended by the poem. Quietly, Alyosha kisses Ivan on the lips. Greatly relieved, Ivan says, That's plagiarism. You stole that from my poem. But I thank you for it. To me, the Grand Inquisitor is ultimately a parable about forgiveness and mutual respect. This is not to say that forgiving someone is always possible. But Alyosha and Ivan are able to maintain an affectionate, brotherly relationship only because each is willing to respect the other's point of view. After all, was not forgiveness central to Jesus' ministry? In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus, after reminding the people of the commandment to love their neighbors, he goes on to say, But I tell you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. In the end, Alyosha stands out as the hero of the story. Despite being surrounded by evil and suffering, he never despairs. He remains true to his faith, and he is someone who cares deeply about others. What we learn, I think, is that for Dostoevsky, who considered himself a Christian, religion is not so much about beliefs, it's about attitudes and behavior, being respectful, being compassionate, and being willing to forgive. The book ends with Alyosha speaking to a group of children from impoverished families, 
to whom he has served as a mentor and guardian. He tells them, let us be first of all kind and then honest, and finally let us never forget one another. One of the boys responds, and let's always go like this, hand in hand, throughout our lives, and three cheers for Karamazov. And again, the boys cheered Alyosha. Note to viewer, we will now consider two works by Albert Camus. You may find his worldview somewhat bleak. Therefore, in this next section of the video, I have inserted a few cartoons solely for the purposes of comic relief. We turn now to Albert Camus, the French author and existentialist philosopher. I'm going to introduce his essay, The Myth of Sisyphus, by quoting from the Encyclopedia Britannica. Influenced by the philosophers Soren Kierkegaard, Arthur Schopenhauer, and Friedrich Nietzsche, Camus argues that life is essentially meaningless, although humans continue to try to impose order on existence and to look for answers to unanswerable questions. Camus begins his essay by posing the following question. If life is meaningless, doesn't that imply that the only rational thing to do is to commit suicide? His answer is no. Carl, no! Camus wrote, in order to exist, man must rebel, but rebellion must respect the limits that it discovers in itself, limits where minds meet and in meeting begin to exist. Instead of giving up and giving in, Camus recommends rebellion against a world with no meaning. The first step is to accept the world as it is and to stop looking for answers to unanswerable questions. The second step is to take on meaninglessness as a challenge. Since the world does not provide one with a purpose, one is free to create a purpose of one's own, even while recognizing that such a purpose is an invention. According to Greek mythology, Sisyphus defied the gods and put death in chains in order that no man would have to suffer death. The gods were not very happy about this, so they sent Ares, the god of war, to set death free. Don't freak out. It's just to save the date. For his crimes, Sisyphus is condemned by the gods to repeat a meaningless labor over and over again for all eternity. He must roll a boulder up to the top of a mountain only to have to watch helplessly as it rolls back down to the bottom. Camus uses this myth as a metaphor for the individual's persistent struggle against the essential absurdity of life. Camus argues that by courageously accepting the struggle against defeat, the individual gains contentment and identity. In the final sentence of his essay, Camus writes, the struggle itself is enough to fill a man's heart. One must imagine Sisyphus happy. By way of comparison, consider that Candide and his companions also find contentment in accepting their simple life as their destiny and taking what pleasure they can in mundane manual labor as they tend to their farm day in and day out. You know, we're just not reaching that guy. I have been giving this presentation to the IB English classes for several years, and I can honestly tell you that I included a discussion of the plague by Camus long before there was COVID. Now here we are. 
We have all been affected by the pandemic, and we have witnessed firsthand suffering on a massive scale. So this book has become particularly relevant in recent times. The novel is set in the Algerian town of Oran in the 1940s. As the story opens, the main character, Dr. Rieu, witnesses over a matter of days thousands of rats dying mysteriously and ominously in the streets of the town. Soon thereafter, he is called to see a patient sick with fever and large, extremely painful abscesses in the groin, armpit, and neck regions. Almost immediately, he is called to see another patient with the same illness, and then another and another. They all die within days, and there are reports of multiple other cases throughout the city. Dr. Rieu is among the first to realize that an epidemic of bubonic plague is sweeping through the town. In the setting of this novel, before the advent of antibiotics, there is no effective treatment, and the disease is almost always fatal. Those large, painful abscesses were called buboes by medieval doctors, hence the name bubonic plague. Despite the serious risks to his own health, Dr. Rieu is steadfast and undaunted in making his daily rounds to attend to the suffering patients and to do what little he can to comfort them. His dedication to his profession seems to be a simple matter of fact. He does not openly espouse any strong religious or moral principles, nor does he harbor any false hopes that he can do more than comfort the dying. Moreover, he doesn't seem to expect any special reward, and certainly no emotional reward, for his unceasing efforts. As in the myth of Sisyphus, and like Voltaire in Candide, and as we shall see like Vonnegut in Slaughterhouse-Five, Camus conveys here a strong sense of fatalism, of the relative powerlessness of humans to change their destiny in the face of natural forces. Dr. Rieu is like Sisyphus, and with each death caused by bubonic plague, he descends down the mountain with quiet resolve to see his next new patient. Finally, after many months and thousands of deaths, the plague runs its course and comes to an end. The people take to the streets to celebrate. They rejoice while fireworks are set off in the harbor and skyrockets explode with bursts of color above the town. But Camus won't let the story end without one more note of fatalism, acceptance, and compassion from Dr. Rieu. And it was in the midst of shouts rolling against the terrace wall in massive waves that waxed in volume and duration while cataracts of colored fire fell thicker through the darkness, that Dr. Rieu resolved to compile this chronicle so that he should not be one of those who hold their peace, but should bear witness in favor of those plague-stricken people so that some memorial of the injustice and outrage done them might endure. And to state quite simply, what we learn in time of pestilence that there are more things to admire in men than to despise. Nonetheless, he knew that the tale he had to tell couldn't be one of a final victory. It could only be the record of what had had to be done, and what assuredly would have to be done again in the never-ending fight against terror and its relentless onslaughts, despite their personal afflictions, by all who, while unable to be saints but refusing to bow down to pestilences, strive their utmost to be healers. And indeed, as he listened to the cries of joy rising from the town, Ryu remembered that such joy is always imperiled. He knew what those jubilant crowds did not know but could have learned from books 
that the plague bacillus never dies or disappears for good. That it can lie dormant for years and years in furniture and linen chests. That it bides its time in bedrooms, cellars, trunks, and bookshelves. And that perhaps the day would come when, for the bane and the enlightening of men, it would rouse up its rats again and send them forth to die in a happy city. Slaughterhouse-Five is a novel about war and the long-lasting suffering it can cause. It tells the story of Billy Pilgrim and his experiences in World War II as a prisoner of the Germans and his life afterwards. Billy's time in captivity is semi-autobiographical, as Vonnegut himself was taken prisoner by the Germans in World War II. The book is also science fiction fantasy. Whereas Candide's fate leads him on a series of misadventures while traveling across Europe, North Africa, and South America, Billy Pilgrim becomes a time traveler, moving back and forth seemingly at random from one moment in his lifetime to another. Vonnegut thus creates a disjointed storyline, but I think his intention is to reinforce the rather imaginative theme that the orderly procession of time is perhaps an illusion. This is how Billy Pilgrim's story begins. Listen, Billy Pilgrim has come unstuck in time. Billy has gone to sleep a senile widower and awakened on his wedding day. He has walked through a door in 1955 and come out another one in 1941. He has gone back through that door to find himself in 1963. He has seen his birth and death many times, he says, and pays random visits to all the events in between, he says. Billy is spastic in time, has no control over where he is going next, and the trips aren't necessarily fun. He is in a constant state of stage fright, he says, because he never knows what part of his life he's going to have to act in next. We learn very early on that decades after the war, Billy is captured by aliens, the Tralfamadorians, and taken to their planet where he is displayed naked in their zoo. On the plus side, Billy learns about their distinctive way of perceiving time and how it shapes their philosophy about life. When he gets back to Earth, he writes a letter to the local newspaper describing the Tralfamadorians. The letter said that they were two feet high and green and shaped like plumber's friends. Their suction cups were on the ground and their shafts, which were extremely flexible, usually pointed to the sky. At the top of each shaft was a little hand with a green eye in its palm. The creatures were friendly and they could see in four dimensions. They pitied earthlings for being able to see only three. They had many wonderful things to teach earthlings especially about time. Billy promised to tell what some of those wonderful things were in his next letter. The fourth dimension, of course, is time. We will return to the lessons Billy learned on Tralfamador in a little bit. As the story unfolds, we learn that Billy Pilgrim was a chaplain's assistant in the U.S. Army and was captured by the Germans during the Battle of the Bulge. During their time in captivity, both Vonnegut and Billy Pilgrim witnessed the horrors of war, including the firebombing that devastated the beautiful German city of Dresden. The scenes of death and destruction are shockingly tragic and deeply disturbing. The question raised is this, was the firebombing necessary to defeat Hitler or was it partly to avenge the Germans prolonged bombing of London and the rest of Great Britain earlier in the war? Vonnegut sets an unmistakably fatalistic tone early in the novel. After the war, 
Billy sets up an optometry practice for himself. Billy had a framed prayer on his office wall which expressed his method for keeping going, even though he was unenthusiastic about living. A lot of patients who saw the prayer on Billy's wall told him that it helped them to keep going too. It went like this. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom always to tell the difference. Among the things Billy Pilgrim could not change were the past, the present, and the future. Vonnegut here suggests a notion that is a feature of the most stringent form of fatalism, the notion that people do not have free will. This suggestion pops up again when Billy wakes up on a flying saucer after being abducted by the Tralfamadorians. Where am I? said Billy Pilgrim. Trapped in another blob of amber, Mr. Pilgrim. We are where we have to be just now. Three hundred million miles from Earth, bound for a time warp which will get us to Tralfamador in hours rather than centuries. How? How did I get here? It would take another Earthling to explain it to you. Earthlings are the great explainers, explaining why this event is structured as it is, telling how other events may be achieved or avoided. I am a Tralfamadorian, seeing all time as you might see a stretch of the Rocky Mountains. All time is all time. It does not change. It does not lend itself to warnings or explanations. It simply is. Take it moment by moment, and you will find that we are all as I've said before, bugs in amber. You sound to me as though you don't believe in free will, said Billy Pilgrim. If I hadn't spent so much time studying earthlings, said the Tralfamadorian, I wouldn't have any idea what was meant by free will. I've visited 31 inhabited planets in the universe, and I have studied reports on 100 more. Only on Earth is there any talk of free will. A few years after the war, Billy suffers a nervous breakdown. Billy had committed himself in the middle of his final year at the Ilium School of Optometry. Nobody else suspected that he was going crazy. Everybody else thought he looked fine and was acting fine. Now he was in the hospital. The doctors agreed. He was going crazy. Vonnegut tells us, His doctors agreed. He was going crazy. Well, it's not that simple. Clearly, Billy Pilgrim is suffering from what we now call PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, a condition common among veterans of all wars, caused by the unimaginable, unthinkable horrors that they have experienced. In a seemingly irrelevant interlude, Billy becomes acquainted with another patient, who tells Billy about the merits of science fiction literature. Then, out of nowhere, he tells Billy something very interesting. He says, Everything there is to know about life is in the brothers Karamazov. So Slaughterhouse-Five is very much an anti-war novel. Its greatness stems from Vonnegut's skill as a storyteller, as he combines an unflinching portrayal of the horrors of war with the fantasies of science fiction, and from his ability to help the reader see the tragedy, the absurdity, and the dark humor of war all at the same time. Above all else, Vonnegut's compassion for the victims of war shines through. In particular, the lessons learned from the Tralfamadorians are intended to offer comfort, not just to Billy, but to all Earthlings. The Tralfamadorians had a hard time understanding what time looked like to Billy, since he could only see in three dimensions. The guide at the zoo where Billy was on display tried to explain it to the visitors. 
The guide invited the crowd to imagine that they were looking across a desert at a mountain range on a day that was twinkling bright and clear. They could look at a peak or a bird or a cloud, at a stone right in front of them, or even down into a canyon behind them. But among them was this poor earthling, and his head was encased in a steel sphere which he could never take off. There was only one eye hole through which he could look, and welded to that eye hole were six feet of pipe. This was only the beginning of Billy's miseries in the metaphor. He was also strapped to a steel lattice which was bolted to a flat car on rails, and there was no way he could turn his head or touch the pipe. The far end of the pipe rested on a bipod, which was also bolted to the flat car. All Billy could see was the little dot at the end of the pipe. He didn't know he was on a flat car, didn't even know there was anything peculiar about his situation. The flat car sometimes crept, sometimes went extremely fast, often stopped, went uphill, downhill, around curves, along straightaways. Whatever poor Billy saw through the pipe, he had no choice but to say to himself, that's life. The most important thing I learned on Tralfamador was that when a person dies, he only appears to die. He is still very much alive in the past, so it is very silly for people to cry at his funeral. All moments, past, present, and future, always have existed, always will exist. The Tralfamadorians can look at all the different moments just the way we can look at a stretch of the Rocky Mountains, for instance. They can see how permanent all the moments are, and they can look at any moment that interests them. It is just an illusion we have here on Earth that one moment follows another one, like beads on a string, and that once a moment is gone, it is gone forever. When a Tralfamadorian sees a corpse, all he thinks is that the dead person is in a bad condition in that particular moment but that the same person is just fine in plenty of other moments. Now, when I myself hear that somebody is dead, I simply shrug and say what the Tralfamadorians say about dead people, which is, so it goes. What is fascinating to me is that many physicists, including Einstein, have said virtually the same thing. In 1955, when his lifelong friend, Michel Besso, died, Einstein wrote, Now he has departed from this strange world a little ahead of me. That means nothing. People like us who believe in physics know that the distinction between past, present, and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. When Billy gets back to Earth and tries to tell the world about his experiences on Tralfamador, of course everyone believes he's gone completely mad. And that may be so, but perhaps there is nevertheless some wisdom in his madness. The theme here again is fatalism. War is inevitable. Suffering is inevitable. They both come with the territory. But if we pay attention, we may discover from time to time real beauty in this life. Vonnegut is suggesting that we look for opportunities to appreciate the nicer moments and to accept the bad moments with a hefty dose of dark humor. In conclusion, let me tell you about one particular benefit of reading great books. Neuroscience research teaches us that if we witness somebody experiencing a tragedy, we will have greater empathy if we ourselves have experienced that same type of tragedy previously. It turns out that we may not have to experience that particular tragedy in real life. We may reap the same benefit by reading about it in a novel if the author's skills allow him to draw us into the story emotionally.
Professor Jamil Zaki, a Stanford psychologist, makes this point in his book, The War for Kindness, Building Empathy in a Fractured World. A good author can create a type of virtual reality, an old-fashioned kind that relies heavily on the reader's imagination. It is essentially the same result that neuroscientists find using modern high-tech forms of virtual reality. Then there is this fellow. Maurice Hamilton, professor of philosophy at Portland State University, whose special interest is care ethics. He also happens to be a very good friend of mine going back to our days in high school together. Not too long ago, he and a co-author published a book called Care Ethics and Poetry. It is based on the same premise. In this case, that a careful reading of selected poems can increase one's capacity for compassion and empathy. Perhaps these ideas that we have discussed here can shed new light on the virtues we strive to develop in ourselves.